Man and His Symbols by Carl G. Jung and M. L. von Franz, Joseph L. Henderson, Yolanda Jacobi, and Yella Jaffe. Copyright 1964, J. G. Ferguson Publishing. Except Chapter 2, entitled Ancient Myths and Modern Man, by Dr. Joseph L. Henderson, where copyright in this chapter within the United States of America is expressly disclaimed. Narrated by Dennis Rooney. Annotation. This layman's introduction to Jung's psychology consists of five essays dealing with various aspects of his philosophy and thought. For readers fascinated or puzzled by the mysterious world of dreams and psychic symbols. 1964. From the Book Jacket. The first and only work in which Carl G. Jung, the world famous Swiss psychologist, explains to the general reader his greatest contribution to our knowledge of the human mind, the theory of the importance of symbolism, particularly as revealed in dreams. But for a dream, this book would never have been written. That dream, described by John Freeman in the foreword, convinced Jung that he could, indeed should, explain his ideas to those who have no special knowledge of psychology. At the age of 83, Jung worked out the complete plan for this book, including the sections that he wished his four closest associates to write. He devoted the closing months of his life to editing the work and writing his own key section, which he completed only ten days before his death. Throughout the book, Jung emphasizes that man can achieve wholeness only through a knowledge and acceptance of the unconscious, a knowledge acquired through dreams and their symbols. Every dream is a direct, personal, and meaningful communication to the dreamer, a communication that uses the symbols common to all mankind, but uses them always in an entirely individual way, which can be interpreted only by an entirely individual key. More than 500 illustrations complement the text and provide a unique running commentary on Jung's thought. They show the nature and function of dreams, explore the symbolic meaning of modern art, and reveal the psychological meanings of the ordinary experiences of everyday life. They are a reinforcement to Jung's thought and an integral part of man and his symbols. Introduction John Freeman the origins of this book are sufficiently unusual to be of interest, and they bear a direct relation to its contents and what it sets out to do. So let me tell you just how it came to be written. One day in the spring of 1959, the British Broadcasting Corporation invited me to interview for British television Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. The interview was to be done in depth. I knew little enough at that time about Jung and his work, and I at once went to make his acquaintance at his beautiful lakeside home near Zurich. That was the beginning of a friendship that meant a great deal to me, and, I hope, gave some pleasure to Jung in the last years of his life. The television interview has no further place in this story, except that it was accounted successful, and that this book is, by an odd combination of circumstances, an end product of that success. One man who saw Jung on the screen was Wolfgang Fogus, managing director of Aldus Books. Fogus had been keenly interested in the development of modern psychology since his childhood, when he lived near the Freuds in Vienna. And as he watched Jung talking about his life and work and ideas, Fogus suddenly reflected what a pity it was that, while the general outline of Freud's work was well known to educated readers all over the Western world, Jung had never managed to break through to the general public, and was always considered too difficult for popular reading. Fogus, in fact, is the creator of man and his symbols. Having sensed from the TV screen that a warm personal relation existed between Jung and myself, he asked me whether I would join him in trying to persuade Jung to set out some of his more important and basic ideas in language and at a length that would be intelligible and interesting to non-specialist adult readers. I jumped at the idea and set off once more to Zurich, determined that I could convince Jung of the value and importance of such a work. Jung listened to me in his garden for two hours, almost without interruption, and then said no. 
He said it in the nicest possible way, but with great firmness. He had never in the past tried to popularize his work, and he wasn't sure that he could successfully do so now. Anyway, he was old and rather tired, and not keen to take on such a long commitment about which he had so many doubts. Jung's friends will all agree with me that he was a man of most positive decision. He would weigh up a problem with care and without hurry. But when he did give his answer, it was usually final. I returned to London greatly disappointed, but convinced that Jung's refusal was the end of the matter. So it might have been, but for two intervening factors that I had not foreseen. One was the pertinacity of Fogus, who insisted on making one more approach to Jung before accepting defeat. The other was an event that, as I look back on it, still astonishes me. The television program was, as I have said, accounted successful. It brought Jung a great many letters from all sorts of people, many of them ordinary folk with no medical or psychological training, who had been captivated by the commanding presence, the humor, and the modest charm of this very great man, and who had glimpsed in his view of life and human personality something that could be helpful to them. And Jung was very pleased, not simply at getting letters, his mail was enormous at all times, but at getting them from people who would normally have no contact with him. It was at this moment that he dreamed a dream of the greatest importance to him, and as you read this book you will understand just how important that can be. He dreamed that instead of sitting in his study and talking to the great doctors and psychiatrists who used to call on him from all over the world, he was standing in a public place and addressing a multitude of people who were listening to him with rapt attention and understanding what he said. When, a week or two later, Fogus renewed his request that Jung should undertake a new book designed not for the clinic or the philosopher's study, but for the people in the marketplace, Jung allowed himself to be persuaded. He laid down two conditions. First, that the book should not be a single-handed book, but the collective effort of himself and a group of his closest followers, through whom he had attempted to perpetuate his methods and his teaching. Secondly, that I should be entrusted with the task of coordinating the work and resolving any problems that might arise between the authors and the publishers. Lest it should seem that this introduction transgresses the bounds of reasonable modesty, let me say at once that I was gratified by this second condition, but within measure for it very soon came to my knowledge that Jung's reason for selecting me was essentially that he regarded me as being of reasonable but not exceptional intelligence and without the slightest serious knowledge of psychology. Thus I was to Jung the average reader of this book. What I could understand would be intelligible to all who would be interested. What I boggled at might possibly be too difficult or obscure for some. Not unduly flattered by this estimate of my role, I have nonetheless scrupulously insisted, sometimes I fear to the exasperation of the authors, on having every paragraph written and, if necessary, rewritten to a degree of clarity and directness that enables me to say with confidence that this book in its entirety is designed for and addressed to the general reader and that the complex subjects it deals with are treated with a rare and encouraging simplicity. After much discussion, the comprehensive subject of this book was agreed to be Man and His Symbols, and Jung himself selected as his collaborators in the work Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz of Zurich, perhaps his closest professional confidant and friend, Dr. Joseph L. Henderson of San Francisco, one of the most prominent and trusted of American Jungians, Mrs. Aniela Jaffe of Zurich, who, in addition to being an experienced analyst, was Jung's confidential private secretary and his biographer, and Dr. Yolanda Jacobi, who, after Jung himself, is the most experienced author among Jung's Zurich circle. These four people were chosen partly because of their skill and experience in the particular subjects allocated to them, and partly because all of them were completely trusted by Jung to work unselfishly to his instructions as members of a team. Jung's personal responsibility was to plan the structure of the whole book to supervise and direct the work of his collaborators, and himself to write the keynote chapter, Approaching the Unconscious. The last year of his life was devoted almost entirely to this book, and when he died in June 1961, his own section was complete.
He finished it, in fact, only some ten days before his final illness, and his colleagues' chapters had all been approved by him in draft. After his death, Dr. von Franz assumed overall responsibility for the completion of the book in accordance with Jung's express instructions. The subject matter of man and his symbols and its outline were therefore laid down and in detail by Jung. The chapter that bears his name is his work, and, apart from some fairly extensive editing to improve its intelligibility to the general reader, nobody else's. It was written, incidentally, in English. The remaining chapters were written by the various authors to Jung's direction and under his supervision. The final editing of the complete work after Jung's death has been done by Dr. von Franz with a patience, understanding, and good humor that leave the publishers and myself greatly in her debt. Finally, as to the contents of the book itself, Jung's thinking has colored the world of modern psychology more than many of those with casual knowledge realize. Such familiar terms, for instance, as extrovert, introvert, and archetype are all Jungian concepts, borrowed and sometimes misused by others. But his overwhelming contribution to psychological understanding is his concept of the unconscious, not, like the unconscious of Freud, merely a sort of glory hole of repressed desires, but a world that is just as much a vital and real part of the life of an individual as the conscious, cogitating world of the ego, and infinitely wider and richer. The language and the people of the unconscious are symbols, and the means of communications, dreams. Thus, an examination of man and his symbols is, in effect, an examination of man's relation to his own unconscious. And since, in Jung's view, the unconscious is the great guide, friend, and advisor of the conscious, this book is related in the most direct terms to the study of human beings and their spiritual problems. We know the unconscious and communicate with it, a two-way service, principally by dreams. And all through this book, above all in Jung's own chapter, you will find a quite remarkable emphasis placed on the importance of dreaming in the life of the individual. It would be an impertinence on my part to attempt to interpret Jung's work to readers, many of whom will surely be far better qualified to understand it than I am. My role, remember, was merely to serve as a sort of intelligibility filter, and by no means as an interpreter. Nevertheless, I venture to offer two general points that seem important to me as a layman and that may possibly be helpful to other non-experts. The first is about dreams. To Jungians, the dream is not a kind of standardized cryptogram that can be decoded by a glossary of symbol meanings. It is an integral, important, and personal expression of the individual unconscious. It is just as real as any other phenomenon attaching to the individual. The dreamer's individual unconscious is communicating with the dreamer alone and is selecting symbols for its purpose that have meaning to the dreamer and to nobody else. Thus the interpretation of dreams, whether by the analyst or by the dreamer himself, is for the Jungian psychologist an entirely personal and individual business, and sometimes an experimental and very lengthy one as well, that can by no means be undertaken by rule of thumb. The converse of this is that the communications of the unconscious are of the highest importance to the dreamer, naturally so, since the unconscious is at least half of his total being, and frequently offer him advice or guidance that could be obtained from no other source. Thus, when I described Jung's dream about addressing the multitude, I was not describing a piece of magic or suggesting that Jung dabbled in fortune-telling, I was recounting in the simple terms of daily experience how Jung was advised by his own unconscious to reconsider an inadequate judgment he had made with the conscious part of his mind. Now it follows from this that the dreaming of dreams is not a matter that the well-adjusted Jungian can regard as simply a matter of chance. On the contrary, the ability to establish communications with the unconscious is a part of the whole man, and Jungians teach themselves, I can think of no better term, to be receptive to dreams. When, therefore, Jung himself was faced with the critical decision whether or not to write this book, he was able to draw on the resources of both his conscious and his unconscious in making up his mind. And all through this book you will find the dream treated as a direct, personal, and meaningful communication to the dreamer, a communication that uses the symbols common to all mankind, but that uses them on every occasion in an entirely individual way 
that can be interpreted only by an entirely individual key. The second point I wish to make is about a particular characteristic of argumentative method that is common to all the writers of this book, perhaps to all Jungians. Those who have limited themselves to living entirely in the world of the conscious and who reject communication with the unconscious bind themselves by the laws of conscious formal life. With the infallible but often meaningless logic of the algebraic equation, they argue from assumed premises to incontestably deduced conclusions. Jung and his colleagues seem to me, whether they know it or not, to reject the limitations of this method of argument. It is not that they ignore logic, but they appear all the time to be arguing to the unconscious as well as to the conscious. Their dialectical method is itself symbolic and often devious. They convince not by means of the narrowly focused spotlight of the syllogism, but by skirting, by repetition, by presenting a recurring view of the same subject seen each time from a slightly different angle, until suddenly the reader who has never been aware of a single conclusive moment of proof finds that he has unknowingly embraced and taken into himself some wider truth, Jung's arguments and those of his colleagues spiral upward over his subject like a bird circling a tree. At first, near the ground, it sees only a confusion of leaves and branches. Gradually, as it circles higher and higher, the recurring aspects of the tree form a wholeness and relate to their surroundings. Some readers may find this spiraling method of argument obscure or even confusing for a few pages, but not, I think, for long. It is characteristic of Jung's method, and very soon the reader will find it carrying him with it on a persuasive and profoundly absorbing journey. The different sections of this book speak for themselves and require little introduction from me. Jung's own chapter introduces the reader to the unconscious, to the archetypes, and symbols that form its language and to the dreams by which it communicates. Dr. Henderson, in the following chapter, illustrates the appearance of several archetypal patterns in ancient mythology, folk legend, and primitive ritual. Dr. von Franz, in the chapter entitled The Process of Individuation, describes the process by which the conscious and the unconscious within an individual learn to know, respect, and accommodate one another. In a certain sense, this chapter contains not only the crux of the whole book, but perhaps the essence of Jung's philosophy of life. Man becomes whole integrated, calm, fertile, and happy, when and only when the process of individuation is complete, when the conscious and the unconscious have learned to live at peace and to complement one another. Mrs. Daffy, like Dr. Henderson, is concerned with demonstrating, in the familiar fabric of the conscious, man's recurring interest in, almost obsession, with the symbols of the unconscious. They have for him a profoundly significant, almost a nourishing and sustaining inner attraction, whether they occur in the myths and fairy tales that Dr. Henderson analyzes, or in the visual arts, which, as Mrs. Jaffe shows, satisfy and delight us by a constant appeal to the unconscious. Finally, I must say a brief word about Dr. Jacobi's chapter, which is somewhat separate from the rest of the book. It is, in fact, an abbreviated case history of one interesting and successful analysis. The value of such a chapter in a book like this is obvious, but two words of warning are nevertheless necessary. First, as Dr. von Franz points out, there is no such thing as a typical Jungian analysis. There can't be, because every dream is a private and individual communication, and no two dreams use the symbols of the unconscious in the same way. So every Jungian analysis is unique, and it is misleading to consider this one, taken from Dr. Jacobi's clinical files, or any other one there has ever been, as representative or typical. All one can say of the case of Henry and his sometimes lurid dreams is that they form one true example of the way in which the Jungian method may be applied to a particular case. Secondly, the full history of even a comparatively uncomplicated case would take a whole book to recount, Inevitably, the story of Henry's analysis suffers a little in compression. The references, for instance, to the I Ching have been somewhat obscured and lent an unnatural and, to me, unsatisfactory flavor of the occult by being presented out of their full context. Nevertheless, we concluded, and I am sure the reader will agree, that with the warnings duly given, 
The clarity, to say nothing of the human interest of Henry's analysis, greatly enriches this book. I began by describing how Jung came to write Man and His Symbols. I end by reminding the reader of what a remarkable, perhaps unique publication this is. Carl Gustav Jung was one of the great doctors of all time and one of the great thinkers of this century. His object always was to help men and women to know themselves so that by self-knowledge and thoughtful self-use they could lead full, rich, and happy lives. At the very end of his own life, which was as full, rich, and happy as any I have encountered, he decided to use the strength that was left him to address his message to a wider public than he had ever tried to reach before. He completed his task and his life in the same month. This book is his legacy to the broad reading public. Side 1, Tone 1, Contents Side 1, Tone 2, Part 1, Approaching the Unconscious by Carl G. Jung Side 3, Tone 1, Part 2, Ancient Myths and Modern Man by Joseph L. Henderson Side 5, Tone 1 Part 3, The Process of Individuation by M. L. von Franz Side 7, Tone 1 Part 4, Symbolism in the Visual Arts by Aniela Jaffe Side 9, Tone 1 Part 5 Symbols in an Individual Analysis by Yolanda Jacobi Side 10, Tone 1 Conclusion Science and the Unconscious by M. L. von Franz Narrator's Note The five pages of reference notes found in the print edition are not included in this recording. Explanatory notes have been retained. End of note. Part 1. Approaching the Unconscious by Carl G. Jung The Importance of Dreams Man uses the spoken or written word to express the meaning of what he wants to convey. His language is full of symbols, but he also often employs signs or images that are not strictly descriptive. Some are mere abbreviations or strings of initials, such as UN, UNICEF, or UNESCO. Others are familiar trademarks, the names of patent medicines, badges, or insignia. Although these are meaningless in themselves, they have acquired a recognizable meaning through common usage or deliberate intent. Such things are not symbols, they are signs, and they do no more than denote the object to which they are attached. What we call a symbol is a term, a name, or even a picture that may be familiar in daily life, yet that possesses specific connotations in addition to its conventional and obvious meaning. It implies something vague, unknown, or hidden from us. Many Cretan monuments, for instance, are marked with the design of the double ads. This is an object that we know, but we do not know its symbolic implications. For another example... Take the case of the Indian who, after a visit to England, told his friends at home that the English worship animals because he had found eagles, lions, and oxen in old churches. He was not aware, nor are many Christians, that these animals are symbols of the evangelists and are derived from the vision of Ezekiel, and that this in turn has an analogy to the Egyptian sun god Horus and his four sons. There are, moreover, such objects as the wheel and the cross that are known all over the world, yet that have a symbolic significance under certain conditions. Precisely what they symbolize is still a matter for controversial speculation. Thus, a word or an image is symbolic when it implies something more than its obvious and immediate meaning. It has a wider unconscious aspect that is never precisely defined or fully explained, nor can one hope to define or explain it. As the mind explores the symbol, it is led to ideas that lie beyond the grasp of reason. The wheel may lead our thoughts toward the concept of a divine sun, but at this point reason must admit its incompetence. Man is unable to define a divine being. When, with all our intellectual limitations, we call something divine, 
we have merely given it a name, which may be based on a creed, but never on factual evidence. Because there are innumerable things beyond the range of human understanding, we constantly use symbolic terms to represent concepts that we cannot define or fully comprehend. This is one reason why all religions employ symbolic language or images. But this conscious use of symbols is only one aspect of a psychological fact of great importance. Man also produces symbols unconsciously and spontaneously in the form of dreams. It is not easy to grasp this point, but the point must be grasped if we are to know more about the ways in which the human mind works. Man, as we realize if we reflect for a moment, never perceives anything fully or comprehends anything completely. He can see, hear, touch, and taste, but how far he sees, how well he hears, what his touch tells him, and what he tastes, depend upon the number and quality of his senses. These limit his perception of the world around him. By using scientific instruments, he can partly compensate for the deficiencies of his senses. For example, he can extend the range of his vision by binoculars, or of his hearing, by electrical amplification. But the most elaborate apparatus cannot do more than bring distant or small objects within range of his eyes, or make faint sounds more audible. No matter what instrument he uses, at some point he reaches the edge of certainty beyond which conscious knowledge cannot pass. There are, moreover, unconscious aspects of our perception of reality. The first is the fact that even when our senses react to real phenomena, sights and sounds, they are somehow translated from the realm of reality into that of the mind. Within the mind they become psychic events whose ultimate nature is unknowable for the psyche cannot know its own psychical substance. Thus every experience contains an indefinite number of unknown factors, not to speak of the fact that every concrete object is always unknown in certain respects, because we cannot know the ultimate nature of matter itself. Then there are certain events of which we have not consciously taken note. They have remained, so to speak, below the threshold of consciousness. They have happened, but they have been absorbed subliminally without our conscious knowledge. We can become aware of such happenings only in a moment of intuition or by a process of profound thought that leads to a later realization that they must have happened. And though we may have originally ignored their emotional and vital importance, it later wells up from the unconscious as a sort of afterthought. It may appear, for instance, in the form of a dream. As a general rule, the unconscious aspect of any event is revealed to us in dreams, where it appears not as a rational thought, but as a symbolic image. As a matter of history, it was the study of dreams that first enabled psychologists to investigate the unconscious aspect of conscious psychic events. It is on such evidence that psychologists assume the existence of an unconscious psyche, though many scientists and philosophers deny its existence. They argue naively that such an assumption implies the existence of two subjects, or, to put it in a common phrase, two personalities within the same individual. But this is exactly what it does imply, quite correctly, and it is one of the curses of modern man that many people suffer from this divided personality. It is by no means a pathological symptom. It is a normal fact that can be observed at any time and everywhere. It is not merely the neurotic whose right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. This predicament is a symptom of a general unconsciousness that is the undeniable common inheritance of all mankind. Man has developed consciousness slowly and laboriously in a process that took untold ages to reach the civilized state, which is arbitrarily dated from the invention of script in about 4000 B.C. And this evolution is far from complete, for large areas of the human mind are still shrouded in darkness. What we call the psyche is by no means identical with our consciousness and its contents. Whoever denies the existence of the unconscious is in fact assuming that our present knowledge of the psyche is total, and this belief is clearly just as false as the assumption that we know all there is to be known about the natural universe. Our psyche is part of nature, and its enigma is as limitless. Thus we cannot define either the psyche or nature. We can merely state what we believe them to be, and describe as best we can how they function. 
Quite apart, therefore, from the evidence that medical research has accumulated, there are strong grounds of logic for rejecting statements like there is no unconscious. Those who say such things merely express an age-old misoneism, a fear of the new and the unknown. There are historical reasons for this resistance to the idea of an unknown part of the human psyche. Consciousness is a very recent acquisition of nature, and it is still in an experimental state. It is frail, menaced by specific dangers, and easily injured. As anthropologists have noted, one of the most common mental derangements that occur among primitive people is what they call the loss of a soul, which means, as the name indicates, a noticeable disruption, or more technically, a dissociation of consciousness. Among such people, whose consciousness is at a different level of development from ours, the soul or psyche is not felt to be a unit. Many primitives assume that a man has a bush soul as well as his own, and that this bush soul is incarnate in a wild animal or a tree with which the human individual has some kind of psychic identity. This is what the distinguished French ethnologist Lucien de Vibrul called a mystical participation. He later retracted this term under pressure of adverse criticism, but I believe that his critics were wrong. It is a well-known psychological fact that an individual may have such an unconscious identity with some other person or object. This identity takes a variety of forms among primitives. If the bush soul is that of an animal, the animal itself is considered as some sort of brother to the man. A man whose brother is a crocodile, for instance, is supposed to be safe when swimming a crocodile-infested river. If the bush soul is a tree, the tree is presumed to have something like parental authority over the individual concerned. In both cases, an injury to the bush soul is interpreted as an injury to the man. In some tribes, it is assumed that a man has a number of souls. This belief expresses the feeling of some primitive individuals that they each consist of several linked but distinct units. This means that the individual's psyche is far from being safely synthesized. On the contrary, it threatens to fragment only too easily under the onslaught of unchecked emotions. While this situation is familiar to us from the studies of anthropologists, it is not so irrelevant to our own advanced civilization as it might seem. We, too, can become dissociated and lose our identity. We can be possessed and altered by moods or become unreasonable and unable to recall important facts about ourselves or others so that people ask, what the devil has got into you? We talk about being able to control ourselves, but self-control is a rare and remarkable virtue. We may think we have ourselves under control, yet a friend can easily tell us things about ourselves of which we have no knowledge. Beyond doubt, even in what we call a high level of civilization, human consciousness has not yet achieved a reasonable degree of continuity. It is still vulnerable and liable to fragmentation. This capacity to isolate part of one's mind, indeed, is a valuable characteristic. It enables us to concentrate upon one thing at a time, excluding everything else that may claim our attention. But there is a world of difference between a conscious decision to split off and temporarily suppress a part of one's psyche and a condition in which this happens spontaneously, without one's knowledge or consent, and even against one's intention. The former is a civilized achievement, the latter a primitive loss of a soul, or even the pathological cause of a neurosis. Thus, even in our day, the unity of consciousness is still a doubtful affair. It can too easily be disrupted. An ability to control one's emotions that may be very desirable from one point of view would be a questionable accomplishment from another, for it would deprive social intercourse of variety, color, and warmth. It is against this background that we must review the importance of dreams, those flimsy, evasive, unreliable, vague, and uncertain fantasies. To explain my point of view, I should like to describe how it developed over a period of years, and how I was led to conclude that dreams are the most frequent and universally accessible source for the investigation of man's symbolizing faculty. Sigmund Freud was the pioneer who first tried to explore empirically the unconscious background of consciousness. He worked on the general assumption that dreams are not a matter of chance, but are associated with conscious thoughts and problems. This assumption was not in the least arbitrary. 
It was based upon the conclusion of eminent neurologists, for instance, Pierre Janet, that neurotic symptoms are related to some conscious experience. They even appear to be split-off areas of the conscious mind, which at another time and under different conditions can be conscious. Before the beginning of this century, Freud and Josef Breuer had recognized that neurotic symptoms, hysteria, certain types of pain, and abnormal behavior, are in fact symbolically meaningful. They are one way in which the unconscious mind expresses itself, just as it may in dreams, and they are equally symbolic. A patient, for instance, who is confronted with an intolerable situation may develop a spasm whenever he tries to swallow. He can't swallow it. Under similar conditions of psychological stress, another patient has an attack of asthma. He can't breathe the atmosphere at home. A third suffers from a peculiar paralysis of the legs. He can't walk, that is, he can't go on any more. A fourth, who vomits when he eats, cannot digest some unpleasant fact. I could cite many examples of this kind, but such physical reactions are only one form in which the problems that trouble us unconsciously may express themselves. They more often find expression in our dreams. Any psychologist who has listened to numbers of people describing their dreams knows that dream symbols have much greater variety than the physical symptoms of neurosis. They often consist of elaborate and picturesque fantasies. But if the analyst who is confronted by this dream material uses Freud's original technique of free association, he finds that dreams can eventually be reduced to certain basic patterns. This technique played an important part in the development of psychoanalysis, for it enabled Freud to use dreams as the starting point from which the unconscious problem of the patient might be explored. Freud made the simple but penetrating observation that if a dreamer is encouraged to go on talking about his dream images and the thoughts that these prompt in his mind, he will give himself away and reveal the unconscious background of his ailments in both what he says and what he deliberately omits saying. His ideas may seem irrational and irrelevant, but after a time it becomes relatively easy to see what it is that he is trying to avoid, what unpleasant thought or experience he is suppressing. No matter how he tries to camouflage it, everything he says points to the core of his predicament. A doctor sees so many things from the seamy side of life that he is seldom far from the truth when he interprets the hints that his patient produces as signs of an uneasy conscience. What he eventually discovers, unfortunately, confirms his expectations. Thus far, nobody can say anything against Freud's theory of repression and wish fulfillment as apparent causes of dream symbolism. Freud attached particular importance to dreams as the point of departure for a process of free association. But after a time, I began to feel that this was a misleading and inadequate use of the rich fantasies that the unconscious produces in sleep. My doubts really began when a colleague told me of an experience he had during the course of a long train journey in Russia. Though he did not know the language and could not even decipher the Cyrillic script, he found himself musing over the strange letters in which the railway notices were written, and he fell into a reverie in which he imagined all sorts of meanings for them. One idea led to another, and in his relaxed mood, he found that this free association had stirred up many old memories. Among them, he was annoyed to find some long-buried disagreeable topics, things he had wished to forget and had forgotten consciously. He had, in fact, arrived at what psychologists would call his complexes, that is, repressed emotional themes that can cause constant psychological disturbances, or even, in many cases, the symptoms of neurosis. This episode opened my eyes to the fact that it was not necessary to use a dream as the point of departure for the process of free association if one wished to discover the complexes of a patient. It showed me that one can reach the center directly from any point of the compass. One could begin from Cyrillic letters, from meditations upon a crystal ball, a prayer wheel, or a modern painting, or even from casual conversation about some quite trivial event. The dream was no more and no less useful in this respect than any other possible starting point. Nevertheless, dreams have a particular significance, 
even though they often arise from an emotional upset in which the habitual complexes are also involved. The habitual complexes are the tender spots of the psyche which react most quickly to an external stimulus or disturbance. That is why free association can lead one from any dream to the critical secret thoughts. At this point, however, it occurred to me that if I was right so far, it might reasonably follow that dreams have some special and more significant function of their own. Very often dreams have a definite, evidently purposeful structure, indicating an underlying idea or intention, though as a rule the latter is not immediately comprehensible. I therefore began to consider whether one should pay more attention to the actual form and content of a dream rather than allowing free association to lead one off through a train of ideas to complexes that could as easily be reached by other means. This new thought was a turning point in the development of my psychology. It meant that I gradually gave up following associations that led far away from the text of a dream. I chose to concentrate rather on the associations to the dream itself, believing that the latter expressed something specific that the unconscious was trying to say. The change in my attitude toward dreams involved a change of method. The new technique was one that could take account of all the various wider aspects of a dream. A story told by the conscious mind has a beginning, a development, and an end, but the same is not true of a dream. Its dimensions in time and space are quite different. To understand it, you must examine it from every aspect, just as you may take an unknown object in your hands and turn it over and over until you are familiar with every detail of its shape. Perhaps I have now said enough to show how I came increasingly to disagree with free association as Freud first employed it. I wanted to keep as close as possible to the dream itself and to exclude all the irrelevant ideas and associations that it might evoke. True, these could lead one toward the complexes of a patient, but I had a more far-reaching purpose in mind than the discovery of complexes that cause neurotic disturbances. There are many other means by which these can be identified. The psychologist, for instance, can get all the hints he needs by using word association tests, by asking the patient what he associates to a given set of words, and by studying his responses. But to know and understand the psychic life process of an individual's whole personality, it is important to realize that his dreams and their symbolic images have a much more important role to play. Almost everyone knows, for example, that there is an enormous variety of images by which the sexual act can be symbolized, or, one might say, represented in the form of an allegory. Each of these images can lead, by a process of association, to the idea of sexual intercourse and to specific complexes that any individual may have about his own sexual attitudes. But one could just as well unearth such complexes by daydreaming on a set of indecipherable Russian letters. I was thus led to the assumption that a dream can contain some message other than the sexual allegory, and that it does so for definite reasons. To illustrate this point, a man may dream of inserting a key in a lock, of wielding a heavy stick, or of breaking down a door with a battering ram. Each of these can be regarded as a sexual allegory, but the fact that his unconscious, for its own purposes, has chosen one of these specific images, it may be the key, the stick, or the battering ram, is also of major significance. The real task is to understand why the key has been preferred to the stick, or the stick to the ram. And sometimes this might even lead one to discover that it is not the sexual act at all that is represented, but some quite different psychological point. From this line of reasoning, I concluded that only the material that is clearly and visibly part of a dream should be used in interpreting it. The dream has its own limitation. Its specific form itself tells us what belongs to it and what leads away from it. While free association lures one away from that material in a kind of zigzag line, the method I evolved is more like a circumambulation, whose center is the dream picture. I work all around the dream picture and disregard every attempt that the dreamer makes to break away from it. Time and time again in my professional work, I have had to repeat the words, Let's get back to your dream. What does the dream say? For instance, a patient of mine dreamed of a drunken and disheveled vulgar woman. 
In the dream, it seemed that this woman was his wife, though in real life his wife was totally different. On the surface, therefore, the dream was shockingly untrue, and the patient immediately rejected it as dream nonsense. If I, as his doctor, had let him start a process of association, he would inevitably have tried to get as far away as possible from the unpleasant suggestion of his dream. In that case, he would have ended with one of his staple complexes, a complex possibly that had nothing to do with his wife, and we should have learned nothing about the special meaning of this particular dream. What, then, was his unconscious trying to convey by such an obviously untrue statement? Clearly, it somehow expressed the idea of a degenerate female who was closely connected with the dreamer's life. But since the projection of this image onto his wife was unjustified and factually untrue, I had to look elsewhere before I found out what this repulsive image represented. In the Middle Ages, long before the physiologists demonstrated that by reason of our glandular structure there are both male and female elements in all of us, it was said that every man carries a woman within himself. It is this female element in every male that I have called the anima. This feminine aspect is essentially a certain inferior kind of relatedness to the surroundings, and particularly to women, which is kept carefully concealed from others as well as from oneself. In other words, though an individual's visible personality may seem quite normal, he may well be concealing from others or even from himself the deplorable condition of the woman within. That was the case with this particular patient. His female side was not nice. His dream was actually saying to him, You are in some respects behaving like a degenerate female, and thus gave him an appropriate shock. An example of this kind, of course, must not be taken as evidence that the unconscious is concerned with moral injunctions. The dream was not telling the patient to behave better, but was simply trying to balance the lopsided nature of his conscious mind, which was maintaining the fiction that he was a perfect gentleman throughout. It is easy to understand why dreamers tend to ignore and even deny the message of their dreams. Consciousness naturally resists anything unconscious and unknown. I have already pointed out the existence among primitive peoples of what anthropologists call misoneism, a deep and superstitious fear of novelty. The primitives manifest all the reactions of the wild animal against untoward events. But civilized man reacts to new ideas in much the same way, erecting psychological barriers to protect himself from the shock of facing something new. This can easily be observed in any individual's reaction to his own dreams when obliged to admit a surprising thought. Many pioneers in philosophy, science, and even literature have been victims of the innate conservatism of their contemporaries. Psychology is one of the youngest of the sciences. Because it attempts to deal with the working of the unconscious, it has inevitably encountered misoneism in an extreme form. Past and Future in the Unconscious So far, I have been sketching some of the principles on which I approached the problem of dreams. For when we want to investigate man's faculty to produce symbols, dreams prove to be the most basic and accessible material for this purpose. The two fundamental points in dealing with dreams are these. First, the dream should be treated as a fact, about which one must make no previous assumption except that it somehow makes sense. And second, the dream is a specific expression of the unconscious. One could scarcely put these principles more modestly. No matter how low anyone's opinion of the unconscious may be, he must concede that it is worth investigating. The unconscious is at least on a level with the louse, which, after all, enjoys the honest interest of the entomologist. If somebody with little experience and knowledge of dreams thinks that dreams are just chaotic occurrences without meaning, he is at liberty to do so. But if one assumes that they are normal events, which, as a matter of fact, they are, one is bound to consider that they are either causal, that is, that there is a rational cause for their existence, or, in a certain way, purposive, or both. Let us now look a little more closely at the ways in which the conscious and unconscious contents of the mind are linked together. Take an example with which everyone is familiar. Suddenly, you find you cannot remember what you were going to say next, though a moment ago the thought was perfectly clear. 
or perhaps you were about to introduce a friend, and his name escaped you as you were about to utter it. You say you cannot remember. In fact, though, the thought has become unconscious, or at least momentarily separated from consciousness. We find the same phenomenon with our senses. If we listen to a continuous note on the fringe of audibility, the sound seems to stop at regular intervals and then start again. Such oscillations are due to a periodic decrease and increase in one's attention, not to any change in the note. But when something slips out of our consciousness, it does not cease to exist any more than a car that has disappeared round a corner has vanished into thin air. It is simply out of sight. Just as we may later see the car again, so we come across thoughts that were temporarily lost to us. Thus part of the unconscious consists of a multitude of temporarily obscured thoughts, impressions, and images that in spite of being lost continue to influence our conscious minds. A man who is distracted or absent-minded will walk across the room to fetch something. He stops, seemingly perplexed. He has forgotten what he was after. His hands grope about among the objects on the table as if he were sleepwalking. He is oblivious of his original purpose, yet he is unconsciously guided by it. Then he realizes what it is that he wants. His unconscious has prompted him. If you observe the behavior of a neurotic person, you can see him doing many things that he appears to be doing consciously and purposefully. Yet if you ask him about them, you will discover that he is either unconscious of them or has something quite different in mind. He hears and does not hear. He sees, yet is blind. He knows and is ignorant. Such examples are so common that the specialist soon realizes that unconscious contents of the mind behave as if they were conscious and that you can never be sure in such cases whether thought, speech, or action is conscious or not. It is this kind of behavior that makes so many physicians dismiss statements by hysterical patients as utter lies. Such persons certainly produce more untruths than most of us, but lie is scarcely the right word to use. In fact, their mental state causes an uncertainty of behavior because their consciousness is liable to unpredictable eclipse by an interference from the unconscious. Even their skin sensations may reveal similar fluctuations of awareness. At one moment, the hysterical person may feel a needle prick in the arm. At the next, it may pass unnoticed. If his attention can be focused on a certain point, the whole of his body can be completely anesthetized until the tension that causes this blackout of the senses has been relaxed. Sense perception is then immediately restored. All the time, however, he has been unconsciously aware of what was happening. The physician can see this process quite clearly when he hypnotizes such a patient. It is easy to demonstrate that the patient has been aware of every detail. The prick in the arm or the remark made during an eclipse of consciousness can be recalled as accurately as if there had been no anesthesia or forgetfulness. I recall a woman who was once admitted to the clinic in a state of complete stupor. When she recovered consciousness next day, she knew who she was but did not know where she was, how or why she had come there, or even the date. Yet after I had hypnotized her, she told me why she had fallen ill, how she had got to the clinic, and who had admitted her. All these details could be verified. She was even able to tell the time at which she had been admitted, because she had seen a clock in the entrance hall. Under hypnosis, her memory was as clear as if she had been completely conscious all the time. When we discuss such matters, we usually have to draw on evidence supplied by clinical observation. For this reason, many critics assume that the unconscious and all its subtle manifestations belong solely to the sphere of psychopathology. They consider any expression of the unconscious as something neurotic or psychotic, which has nothing to do with a normal mental state. But neurotic phenomena are by no means the products exclusively of disease. They are in fact no more than pathological exaggerations of normal occurrences. It is only because they are exaggerations that they are more obvious than their normal counterparts. Hysterical symptoms can be observed in all normal persons, but they are so slight that they usually pass unnoticed. Forgetting, for instance, is a normal process in which certain conscious ideas lose their specific energy because one's attention has been deflected. When interest turns elsewhere, it leaves in shadow the things with which one was previously concerned, 
just as a searchlight lights up a new area by leaving another in darkness. This is unavoidable, for consciousness can keep only a few images in full clarity at one time, and even this clarity fluctuates. But the forgotten ideas have not ceased to exist. Although they cannot be reproduced at will, they are present in a subliminal state, just beyond the threshold of recall, from which they can rise again spontaneously at any time, often after many years of apparently total oblivion. I am speaking here of things we have consciously seen or heard and subsequently forgotten. But we all see, hear, smell, and taste many things without noticing them at the time, either because our attention is deflected or because the stimulus to our senses is too slight to leave a conscious impression. The unconscious, however, has taken note of them, and such subliminal sense perceptions play a significant part in our everyday lives. Without our realizing it, they influence the way in which we react to both events and people. An example of this that I found particularly revealing was provided by a professor who had been walking in the country with one of his pupils, absorbed in serious conversation. Suddenly he noticed that his thoughts were being interrupted by an unexpected flow of memories from his early childhood. He could not account for this distraction. Nothing in what had been said seemed to have any connection with these memories. On looking back, he saw that he had been walking past a farm when the first of these childhood recollections had surged up in his mind. He suggested to his pupil that they should walk back to the point where the fantasies had begun. Once there, he noticed the smell of geese, and instantly he realized that it was this smell that had touched off the flow of memories. In his youth, he had lived on a farm where geese were kept, and their characteristic smell had left a lasting, though forgotten, impression. As he passed the farm on his walk, he had noticed the smell subliminally, and this unconscious perception had called back long-forgotten experiences of his childhood. The perception was subliminal because the attention was engaged elsewhere, and the stimulus was not strong enough to deflect it and to reach consciousness directly, yet it had brought up the forgotten memories. Such a cue or trigger effect can explain the onset of neurotic symptoms as well as more benign memories when a sight, smell, or sound recalls a circumstance in the past. A girl, for instance, may be busy in her office, apparently in good health and spirits. A moment later, she develops a blinding headache and shows other signs of distress. Without consciously noticing it, she has heard the foghorn of a distant ship, and this has unconsciously reminded her of an unhappy parting with a lover whom she has been doing her best to forget. Aside from normal forgetting, Freud has described several cases that involve the forgetting of disagreeable memories, memories that one is only too ready to lose. As Nietzsche remarked, where pride is insistent enough, memory prefers to give way. Thus, among the lost memories, we encounter not a few that owe their subliminal state and their incapacity to be voluntarily reproduced to their disagreeable and incompatible nature. The psychologist calls these repressed contents. A case in point might be that of a secretary who is jealous of one of her employer's associates. She habitually forgets to invite this person to meetings, though the name is clearly marked on the list she is using. But if challenged on the point, she simply says she forgot or was interrupted. She never admits, not even to herself, the real reason for her omission. Many people mistakenly overestimate the role of willpower and think that nothing can happen to their minds that they do not decide and intend. But one must learn to discriminate carefully between intentional and unintentional contents of the mind. The former are derived from the ego personality. The latter, however, arise from a source that is not identical with the ego, but is its other side. It is this other side that would have made the secretary forget the invitations. There are many reasons why we forget things that we have noticed or experienced, and there are just as many ways in which they may be recalled to mind. An interesting example is that of cryptomnesia, or concealed recollection. An author may be writing steadily to a preconceived plan, working out an argument or developing the line of a story, when he suddenly runs off at a tangent. Perhaps a fresh idea has occurred to him, or a different image, or a whole new subplot. If you ask him what prompted the digression, he will not be able to tell you. 
He may not even have noticed the change, though he has now produced material that is entirely fresh and apparently unknown to him before. Yet it can sometimes be shown convincingly that what he has written bears a striking similarity to the work of another author, a work that he believes he has never seen. I myself found a fascinating example of this in Nietzsche's book Thus Spake Zarathustra, where the author reproduces almost word for word an incident reported in a ship's log for the year 1686. By sheer chance I had read this seaman's yarn in a book published about 1835, half a century before Nietzsche wrote, and when I found the similar passage in Thus Spake Zarathustra, I was struck by its peculiar style, which was different from Nietzsche's usual language. I was convinced that Nietzsche must also have seen the old book, though he made no reference to it. I wrote to his sister, who was still alive, and she confirmed that she and her brother had in fact read the book together when he was eleven years old. I think, from the context, it is inconceivable that Nietzsche had any idea that he was plagiarizing this story. I believe that fifty years later it had unexpectedly slipped into focus in his conscious mind. Note. Nietzsche's cryptomnesia is discussed in Jung's on the Psychology of So-Called Occult Phenomena in Collected Works, Volume 1. The relevant passage from the ship's log and the corresponding passage from Nietzsche are as follows. From J. Kerner, Blätter aus Prevorst, Volume 4, page 57, headed, An Extract of Awe-Inspiring Import, originally 1831-37. to The four captains and a merchant, Mr. Bell, went ashore on the island of Mount Stromboli to shoot rabbits. At three o'clock they mustered the crew to go aboard, when, to their inexpressible astonishment, they saw two men flying rapidly toward them through the air. One was dressed in black, the other in gray. They came past them very closely, in greatest haste, and, to their utmost dismay, descended into the crater of the terrible volcano, Mount Stromboli. They recognized the pair as acquaintances from London. From F. Nietzsche, Thus Spake Zarathustra, Chapter 40, Great Events, Translated by Common, page 180, Slightly Modified, Originally 1883. Now about the time that Zarathustra sojourned on the Happy Isles, it happened that a ship anchored at the isle on which the Smoking Mountain stands, and the crew went ashore to shoot rabbits. About the noontide hour, however, when the captain and his men were together again, they suddenly saw a man coming toward them through the air, and a voice said distinctly, It is time, it is highest time. But when the figure drew close to them, flying past quickly like a shadow in the direction of the volcano, they recognized with the greatest dismay that it was Zarathustra. Behold, said the old helmsman, Zarathustra goes down to hell. End of note. In this type of case, there is genuine, if unrealized, recollection. Much the same sort of thing may happen to a musician who has heard a peasant tune or popular song in childhood and finds it cropping up as the theme of a symphonic movement that he is composing in adult life. An idea or an image has moved back from the unconscious into the conscious mind. What I have so far said about the unconscious is no more than a cursory sketch of the nature and functioning of this complex part of the human psyche, but it should have indicated the kind of subliminal material from which the symbols of our dreams may be spontaneously produced. This subliminal material can consist of all urges, impulses, and intentions, all perceptions and intuitions, all rational or irrational thoughts, conclusions, inductions, deductions, and premises, and all varieties of feeling. Any or all of these can take the form of partial, temporary, or constant unconsciousness. Such material has mostly become unconscious because, in a manner of speaking, there is no room for it in the conscious mind. Some of one's thoughts lose their emotional energy and become subliminal. That is to say, they no longer receive so much of our conscious attention because they have come to seem uninteresting or irrelevant or because there is some reason why we wish to push them out of sight. It is, in fact, normal and necessary for us to forget in this fashion in order to make room in our conscious minds for new impressions and ideas. If this did not happen, 
everything we experienced would remain above the threshold of consciousness and our minds would become impossibly cluttered. This phenomenon is so widely recognized today that most people who know anything about psychology take it for granted. But just as conscious contents can vanish into the unconscious, new contents, which have never yet been conscious, can arise from it. One may have an inkling, for instance, that something is on the point of breaking into consciousness, that something is in the air, or that one smells a rat. The discovery that the unconscious is no mere depository of the past, but is also full of germs of future psychic situations and ideas, led me to my own new approach to psychology. A great deal of controversial discussion has arisen around this point but it is a fact that in addition to memories from a long-distant conscious past, completely new thoughts and creative ideas can also present themselves from the unconscious, thoughts and ideas that have never been conscious before. They grow up from the dark depths of the mind like a lotus and form a most important part of the subliminal psyche. We find this in everyday life, where dilemmas are sometimes solved by the most surprising new propositions. Many artists, philosophers, and even scientists owe some of their best ideas to inspirations that appear suddenly from the unconscious. The ability to reach a rich vein of such material and to translate it effectively into philosophy, literature, music, or scientific discovery is one of the hallmarks of what is commonly called genius. We can find clear proof of this fact in the history of science itself. For example, the French mathematician Poincaré and the chemist Kekulé owed important scientific discoveries, as they themselves admit, to sudden pictorial revelations from the unconscious. The so-called mystical experience of the French philosopher Descartes involved a similar sudden revelation, in which he saw in a flash the order of all sciences. The British author Robert Louis Stevenson had spent years looking for a story that would fit his strong sense of man's double being when the plot of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was suddenly revealed to him in a dream. Later, I shall describe in more detail how such material arises from the unconscious, and I shall examine the form in which it is expressed. At the moment, I simply want to point out that the capacity of the human psyche to produce such new material is particularly significant when one is dealing with dream symbolism, for I have found again and again in my professional work that the images and ideas that dreams contain cannot possibly be explained solely in terms of memory. They express new thoughts that have never yet reached the threshold of consciousness. The Function of Dreams I have gone into some detail about the origins of our dream life because it is the soil from which most symbols originally grow. Unfortunately, dreams are difficult to understand. As I have already pointed out, a dream is quite unlike a story told by the conscious mind. In everyday life, one thinks out what one wants to say, selects the most telling way of saying it, and tries to make one's remarks logically coherent. For instance, an educated person will seek to avoid a mixed metaphor because it may give a muddled impression of his point. But dreams have a different texture. Images that seem contradictory and ridiculous crowd in on the dreamer. The normal sense of time is lost, and commonplace things can assume a fascinating or threatening aspect. It may seem strange that the unconscious mind should order its material so differently from the seemingly disciplined pattern that we can impose on our thoughts in waking life. Yet anyone who stops for a moment to recall a dream will be aware of this contrast, which is in fact one of the main reasons why the ordinary person finds dreams so hard to understand. They do not make sense in terms of his normal waking experience, and therefore he is inclined either to disregard them or to confess that they baffle him. Perhaps it may be easier to understand this point if we first realize the fact that the ideas with which we deal in our apparently disciplined waking life are by no means as precise as we like to believe. On the contrary, their meaning and their emotional significance for us becomes more imprecise the more closely we examine them. The reason for this is that anything we have heard or experienced can become subliminal, that is to say, can pass into the unconscious. And even what we retain in our conscious mind and can reproduce at will has acquired an unconscious undertone that will color the idea each time it is recalled. Our conscious impressions, in fact, quickly assume an element of unconscious meaning 
that is psychically significant for us, though we are not consciously aware of the existence of this subliminal meaning or of the way in which it both extends and confuses the conventional meaning. Of course, such psychic undertones differ from one person to another. Each of us receives any abstract or general notion in the context of the individual mind, and we therefore understand and apply it in our individual ways. When, in conversation, I use any such terms as state, money, health, or society, I assume that my listeners understand more or less the same thing as I do. But the phrase more or less makes my point. Each word means something slightly different to each person, even among those who share the same cultural background. The reason for this variation is that a general notion is received into an individual context and is therefore understood and applied in a slightly individual way. And the difference of meaning is naturally greatest when people have widely different social, political, religious, or psychological experiences. As long as concepts are identical with mere words, the variation is almost imperceptible and plays no practical role. But when an exact definition or a careful explanation is needed, one can occasionally discover the most amazing variations, not only in the purely intellectual understanding of the term, but particularly in its emotional tone and its application. As a rule, these variations are subliminal and therefore never realized. One may tend to dismiss such differences as redundant or expendable nuances of meaning that have little relevance to everyday needs, but the fact that they exist shows that even the most matter-of-fact contents of consciousness have a penumbra of uncertainty around them. Even the most carefully defined philosophical or mathematical concept which we are sure does not contain more than we have put into it, is nevertheless more than we assume. It is a psychic event, and as such, partly unknowable. The very numbers you use in counting are more than you take them to be. They are at the same time mythological elements.